Okay, we're good now. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Scroggins, president of Mount San Antonio College. Welcome to our virtual town hall that's being delivered in Zoom webinar format. I wanna thank my executive assistant, Carol Nelson, for uh, hosting uh, this Zoom conference and to uh, Jill Dolan, our Director of Community Affairs for handling the Q&A portion of the meeting, which is available on your Zoom uh, dashboard and will be answered uh, with uh, text uh, comments during the meeting and with an open Q&A at the end if time permits. Today's uh, topics are the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the, the situation in the state, the, the county and the college, as well as the impact of the governor's uh, budget revise, which was delivered last week. So let me begin by saying that I, I certainly want to extend my thanks and appreciation to all the faculty who've been teaching online and all the managers and staff who've been telecommuting. This was a huge change in not only your, your work environment, but in the very essence of what we are as community college educators. More than that, it's a challenge because the environment in which we had to make this decision was one of fear and trepidation and unknown. And that is uh, as upsetting as the change in our work environment and the change in learning to use technology in different ways. We had a very touching uh, virtual uh, vigil yesterday in, in which there was a celebration of life and a recognition of those that many of us have seen suffer under the contagion of the virus and even losing friends, family, and colleagues. So that is a, a shadow over what we do but it's also an encouragement to continue with the work that we're doing in the safe at home environment to control this situation and come out the other side whole and as individuals and whole as a college. So let me tell you a little bit about the situation with the virus in our state. As you may know, our governor has a recovery plan uh, that's moving to step two for counties that meet certain criteria and he's published those counties, and you can see on the news, Orange County beaches, et cetera. But Los Angeles County, and in all counties, have the uh, opportunity to evaluate the local situations. LA County has its own roadmap to recovery with phases, and it's dependent on the data, as is the state plan. And in LA County, we continue to experience relatively high levels of new uh, infection and uh, the fatality rate continues to be worrisome. So they're not yet uh, announcing a phase two transition, a stage two as the county calls it. But you may have heard in the news just this week that they're anticipating if the current trend continues that we may be in phase two by July 4th. Uh, the data show that there has been a, a slowdown in both the rate of infection and the fatality rate, uh, although there still increases. Uh, that is worrisome and one of the reasons that the commitment is to retain stay at home until the, the data looks like we have a more safe, not a safe, but a more safe environment to open stage two, which is for for low risk businesses and, and public operations. Stage three is where colleges and universities and K-12 uh, have the opportunity to open. But even under the circumstances that the county has uh, laid out for the colleges and, and universities and K-12s to uh, open up in phase three, the standards are high. Uh, the, the uh, social distancing, the high level of hygiene, the assessment of those, everyone who would be on campus for symptoms, 
to follow up with testing, to do uh, contact tra tracking, to be able to have a high level of control for that, this coming out, if you will. Uh, in an encouraging note, uh, the data on the use of hospital beds in LA County has shown a decline in that need to the point where you may have seen the, the Navy vessel, the hospital ship that was here in LA docks to help with the hospitalization challenges has uh, been released to go back to San Diego. You can see the data uh, for LA County. It shows very modest uh, adjustments in both the contagion rate and the fatality rate. But uh, an important piece is what is called R, the, the, uh, the, the ratio of the new infections to those uh, total in the population. In the worst periods where those spikes that you see, the ratio was three to one. That means that every, uh, for every person who was identified as contagious, there were three who became contagious. Every, excuse me, every person in the population that was contagious, there were three who got the virus. That contagion rate is uh, uh, re really a, a w behind those spikes. Currently, at least for the last two weeks, that R value, that contagion rate is one to one. That is on average, this is just an average, uh, over a two week period, uh, there's one new person for every person who is contagious. So that is directly attributable to the stay at home quarantine process. And that's one of the reasons the county is dedicated to that. And that's one of the reasons we'll need to wait as a college to come back. We are advocating for key programs to come back as early as possible. Those are our programs for first responders, our paramedic and fire academy, and for our health professional uh, programs, uh, nursing, respiratory therapy, radiologic technology. And on the, again, on the encouraging side, we've been able to get uh, clinical placements for nursing starting next month and soon following will be rad tech and respiratory therapy. Those clinical placements are important for those programs finishing their, their uh, degrees and being able to get their certifications. All of those that we train are much needed in this environment. So our role is to be prepared. So we're looking at options for if we move to phase three later in the summer or early in the fall, we initially planned a few on-campus courses. Uh, there we are, you can see where, where phase three uh, would be. Stage three is a little arrow at the bottom. There's the things that we have to do. But we've learned with the uh, opening of the chance to move beyond phase two to phase three being later in the summer, the plans that we had as options to open uh, on-campus courses for CTE and labs uh, are, are not going to be achievable in the time frame that the county has set for moving to the next stage. We're still working on options for the fall. We've got a work group. It's a broad uh, representation led by uh, Morris Mark Rodriguez, our Vice President of Administrative Services, who's working with our entire team uh, to look at those opportunities. I, I want, to, want to express appreciation for the faculty who are looking at the opportunity to teach CTE and lab courses on campus in the summer and volunteered to do that and uh, participated in setting the schedule and the timeline and the safety procedures. Uh, some of the things we're doing, for example, is uh, we're creating a second level of custodial qualifications that would be on hand to, to be present in buildings in which on-campus classes would be open to keep the, the, the deep cleaning and continual cleaning on hand. We're looking at other needs to have safe uh, and secure environment to the extent possible if we're bringing classes back to campus. All of that, of course, is for reopening is related to the huge economic impact that the uh, that, that the COVID-19 virus has had on our state economy. Uh, the 
huge $54 billion deficit that the governor announced in preparation for the May revise is unprecedented. Uh, we were all very concerned seeing that number as to what the impact would be on California community colleges. Uh, there, there are some encouraging factors in the governor's May revision of the January proposal for next year and in the Department of Finance uh, disclosures about how the deficit in income, even in this fiscal year, would impact the 1920 budget for community colleges. So uh, on those encouraging sides, the 1920 budget uh, will be based on the P1 rebenching, and those are magic terms to us, but kind of opaque to everyone else. What that means is that the effort that the college has done in improving the, the metrics, the funding rates for all of the factors in the student-centered funding formula meant that we uh, earned additional student-centered funding formula income above what we projected for this year. And uh, there will be a presentation to the Board of Trustees in a couple of weeks to uh, share the information both on that additional revenue and on the impact that the Department of Finance uh, guidelines for this year will, will have on us. And in addition, we'll do some preparation for next year's budget with some belt tightening in the last phases of this year's budget. But the good news is in the May revise that the current year uh, adjustments to the budget consist primarily of a one month deferral of the income from, for the unrestricted general fund, the state contribution. Of course, that's only a deferral of the state contribution. We also get income from property taxes and student fees. So it's as yet unknown what the dollar amount of that deferral will be, but our cash position is very good to assure that there's no uh, impact on our, our college as a result of that deferral. Those of you who were around in 2008 know that that was a portion of the solution that the state included in the Great Recession. One of the things that's different about what happened in 2008 was there was a workload reduction. Again, magic terms to us. What that means is that the expectation for the production of enrollment, the full-time equivalent students, the factor that drove uh, our budget back then, would cut down the uh, expectation for classes and there was rollback in class offerings. This time, there's not a workload reduction proposed for 2021, but rather a reduction in the funding levels in the student-centered funding formula. This is controversial because at the same time that we're expected to produce the same amount of enrollment, that means cutting what you get paid, not the amount of work you do, the governor is asking us to do even more uh, to uh, continue to support those students who are most at risk uh, by using our, the flexibility in funds that the 2021 budget proposal gives us for things like uh, the need for food, housing, and fi financial support. We're very committed to that. We certainly serve a, a, a variety of high-risk populations that we've been very successful with. And we've continued, thanks again to your efforts, to hold on to those students during the spring semester and we're planning a fall semester that is not a workload reduction, except in areas where we're going to have challenges with the ability to bring classes back on campus. No decisions have been made yet about the fall schedule. It, there are budget impacts to consider, but a college is committed to offering as full a range of courses and course sections as possible. We are well prepared from the, the years of strong economic growth in California to handle a recession. We all knew it was coming. <laughs> We're a state that's a cycle of boom and bust. And so we have a good cash balance. We have a good investments in our OPEB trust. Again, magic words to us, so that means 
our investment in the funds that pays your retirement health benefits. We're in a good position with that fund. And we're in a good position with an additional trust that was established to, uh, in a recession, in a challenging crisis like this, to uh, defer, what well, rather cover the costs of the employer contribution to the uh, CalSTRS teacher retirement system and the CalSTRS employee retirement system. We're working through those impacts right now. Of course, the May revise just happened last week, but we have been prepared for this eventuality. And so far, there are no surprises, except I would say, looking at that $54 billion state deficit, doing a little math, I was worried about the total number of millions that we're going to need to adjust our 2021 budget. It looks like two things happen that are good for us. One is that, as I said, we are using the P1 from 2019-20 moving forward. That is a good starting point. Secondly, the way the state approached what was a 10% cut to almost all education systems with respect to, to general funding, not categorical funding, that 10% cut was applied after the 2.21% COLA was added to our 1920 base, uh, but base budgets. That meant that instead of 10%, the cut was just under 8%, which, uh, you know, 2% of, of our budget, that, that, that's a huge budget savings. So when you combine our good cash situation, our saving against a recession, the way the state has approached deferrals and the pass through, uh, budget cuts, we are in a position uh, to be secure of all positions. We're not looking at any kind of in permanent employee reductions, and we're looking at maintaining our efforts to support students both in the classroom and in their life skill areas. There are additional opportunities to support us through this recession in the federal funding, but I'm going to let Morris talk about that as he talks about what's happening in his world of administrative services. So as you have questions about either the colleges move forward with dealing with the COVID-19 virus and the impact on the college, or with our early understanding of what our budget will look like, and given the challenges of the delays in state revenue collection, we're not going to know our full state budget until probably August or September. But fortunately, the state expectation for when we would complete this budget analysis for next year is similarly, as it was in 2008, uh, delayed for a couple of months into the fall. So we have time to adjust to this level of cuts that we just found out about and we're well prepared going forward to have the college not only uh, sustain its work, but be prepared to come out of this recession stronger than ever. Thank you. So next up, we have a, a representation from our faculty and staff as comments on the, these two topics followed by comments from our vice presidents. Next up is Chisa, president of the Academic Senate. Chisa. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so thankful to be with all of you here today, and I'm so glad that all of you are here with us. I continue to be tremendously proud of the work that's happened across campus to support students and each other during this challenging time. I want to start by thanking faculty who've done just an incredible job of being responsive to the needs of students. I also want to thank the dedicated classified staff, um, particularly in this week of uh, classified staff appreciation, as well as our supportive managers, without whom this work just simply would not have been possible. 
The work of the Senate overall over this past year has been focused on the goals of integrating equity, sustainability, and guided pathways into the Senate and shared governance process. This has required listening to our college community, reevaluating our approach, questioning our assumptions, and deepening our understanding of student needs, all of which was great training for the COVID-19 crisis. But even with a strong understanding of our students and their needs, there was much that happened in the past couple of months for which none of us could have prepared. Actions taken by Senate during this time demonstrate our commitments and address the urgent academic and professional matters of the college, including student preparation, equity, achievement and success, curriculum instruction, and professional development. All of these actions were undertaken with broad cross campus collaboration. Um, and some of those that I'm talking about include supporting transition to online learning. We brought about 95% of all of our sections online, as well as supporting faculty, students, and programs that have not been able to move their classes online. Um, we passed the distance learning committee recommendations for professional development and curriculum so that we will be able to provide instruction both through distance learning and fully online by mutual agreement for summer and fall. Uh, we advocated at the state level for reasonable deadlines for our distance learning curriculum approval process. We've supported students having extended options for dropping classes and alternative grading options. Um, we participated in planning for CARES Act fund distribution to students. We've worked with student services and IT to launch the referral system for faculty to link students to support. Um, we approved a revised, new and improved mission statement, vision, and core values that um, is moving its way through shared governance and I think shows the strong support for these commitments that we have as a campus. As we continue to respond to the challenges and uncertainties of the COVID-19 crisis and impending fiscal impact, I urge us to remember to keep students at the center and to work together collaboratively through shared governance to ensure decision-making that serves and safeguards all members of the college community and fiscal decisions which reflect our instructional mission and enable us to be able to continue to support excellence in teaching and learning for which Mount SAC is known. To make all of this possible, I believe communication is key. Today's town hall is an example of one of the ways that we can be sure to be communicating across campus. I know that there continue to be unanswered questions for faculty. I'm sure there are also for staff and managers and students. Some of these are because of the uncertainty of the current moment. But for those that are due to a lack of communication, I wanna share my commitment to work on behalf of faculty to get timely answers and solutions and to communicate them clearly and effectively. I encourage faculty to submit questions today using the question and answer, and also to continue to contact me directly and other Senate leaders with your questions. I also want to acknowledge, as I said at the vigil yesterday, that while we may all be living through the same crisis, the impact it has on us differs. That is, we may be in the same storm, but not in the same boat. So I hope we can approach our work together with compassion, understanding, and respect, and to continue to listen to each other. I believe strongly that to know the best way forward, we need to be sure to be listening to our students, our community, the faculty, and ensuring we're remembering these voices as well as the voices that we don't hear in the work that we're doing. So thank you to all of you for what you have been doing, and I look forward to continue working with you as we move forward. Thank you very much, Chisa. And I'd like to welcome to present John Llewellyn, the president of the Classified Senate. John. Yes, hello everyone. It is, uh, as Chisa was saying, great to have so many people present. 
Um, obviously, everybody has uh, been uh, kind of taken for a uh, wild ride with this change. I want to uh, start off by saying, since this is Classified Employee Week, I want to say uh, thank you and compliment all the uh, classified who, along with everybody else, I think is just, it's amazing to be able to weather this storm in such a, uh, a, a great manner and uh, transfer everything online and become your own IT department. And, you know, it's, it's no easy task. It's, it takes dedication and real uh, courage. And uh, from what I hear, that's something that everybody has displayed, uh, classified faculty management it's amazing. Um, I, I want to say that the, although some of the classified employee week things we normally do, which are so much fun, ha did not happen. Uh, we are looking at things for the future. Doesn't mean they won't happen sometime or again. Uh, we the classified Senate uh, earlier in this year had uh, formed a uh, constitutional committee that looked at, reviewed, and did some revisions and updates to our classified Senate uh, constitution, basically to uh, ensure that as the campus has changed in the last several years, that the constitution reflected uh, representation properly. So this uh, last past week, it just in, uh, ended, uh, it ends today, we had sent out emails asking for uh, the areas that have openings for senators to nominate uh, themselves or someone. We will have uh, the elections starting and uh, we will get a few new senators to replace either open seats or those that are uh, retiring from the position. Um, I wanna encourage people to take part. Um, those areas will rotate next year, but this is a way we make sure that uh, all the classified, all the different areas um, have uh, appropriate representation on the Senate. So it's a very, it's a good thing. Um, and it shows uh, us still looking forward. We also have several senators and myself working with the Classified Professional Development Committee. We are not expecting to have our Classified Professional Development Day in August, CPD Day, as we've had the last few years. Um, obviously, that's a big in-person thing, very important the way it's been done to be in person. But what we are doing is working to create uh, online opportunities so that classified can still have the opportunities uh, to learn and grow. Uh, so there will be more coming out uh, regarding that in the very near future. But just know that uh, for classified, we are planning some type of online opportunities and a, even a keynote speaker that can be educational and inspirational, um, something very important in this uh, time. So again, I just want to thank the classified um, for being just as wonderful as they are. I already thought they were wonderful, but now I, I can't say enough good about my colleagues and uh, hang in there, everyone. It's it's uphill, but we will make it. And uh, that's my report. Thank you, John. That was excellent. And we look forward to more professional development for Classified. Next up is uh, Joan Scholers, the president of the Mount Sac Faculty Association. Hello, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity. I again want to say thank you for the Classified Appreciation Week. I, uh, we could, this school would not exist without a classified faculty, classified staff, and thank you so much. I also want to say, hey, we miss Faculty Appreciation Week, but for all the faculty that are here in the audience and listening, please, please know that the district, myself, Chisa, everybody that's here, we all appreciate everything you have been doing. And we will, when we get back on campus, the FA will be the one of the first people groups that actually sit down and do something for faculty appreciation. We are dying, you know, it's, it's very hard for all of us not to be around here uh, working with each other. We've been working with the district uh, on, on trying to figure out the concerns and issues of faculty during these unprecedented times. I think I meet at least twice a week, maybe sometimes three times a week with, with the district on, on different issues that have come up. And 
every time we think we get something settled, then something else happens, like all of a sudden we're not on campus in the summer and we've been working on being on campus on the summer for some things. So it's, it's, it's a changing field, but thank you for the district for being willing to work with us. Um, for the faculty out there that are members, you actually have a ratification ballot in the mail. You should have already received that. That is due next week. Please turn that in. I also mailed out yesterday another 1,050 um, ballots for our election for our e-board. Uh, those you should be getting today, tomorrow, hopefully by, by before the weekend. Those are due back the first week of June. Um, I want to say one more thing. Um, I know we as faculty always put our students first, but I need you to stop and take time for yourself and your family. You cannot put students first if you are not there yourself. You have got to take care of yourself and family. And, and I say this all the time, but put some kind of restrictions on yourself time limit so you are not on the computer 20 to 24 hours a day that is not good for you get up walk around do things work with your family take you know take some time for yourself that is really really important i, I just can't say that enough but just you know in this we're we're working on our bylaws and standing rules also for the fa they uh, need to be redone and the e-board and the governance committee are looking at those but we're in the midst of this pandemic and trying to get everything done and even simple things that we could do face to face, like running an election, ask me, is hard to do uh, in this environment. So just remember, we are here for you. If you need anything, give us a holler. Talk to myself, Chisa, Emily, anybody on the, the FA executive board. We're here to listen and try to get some of the problems handled that we can. So thank you. And thank you, Joan. Appreciate the comments. Next up is Robert Stubbe, the president of CSCA 262. Robert. I muted myself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scroggins. Uh, and, and thank you to all my colleagues in um, bargaining unit leadership. Uh, I'd like to join in, in saying happy classified uh, school employees week. And thank you to all of the classified, not just in 262, um, but, but to also give a, a specific shout out to uh, all of the 262 uh, folks that I've been working with uh, through all of this to address issues as they come up. Uh, with regard to Classified School Employees Week, uh, our executive board has decided to um, preserve most of that funding and um, when it's safe to do so, uh, when we get the okay, um, to uh, work with, with our other classified uh, brothers and sisters in uh, 651 Confidential and Classified Senate to, um, to put on a, uh, a huge celebration, um, think food. Uh, I, think, I know that's a, a highlight of Classified School Employees Week uh, during normal circumstances is uh, the barbecue and the luncheon. So uh, we'd like to, to join in doing something like that to celebrate um, being back on campus. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, all, all of the faculty. Um, you know, we know um, that without the faculty's commitment to um, persist in instructing our students that uh, the college would not have, um, wouldn't, you know, if, we wouldn't be doing our mission and, and the state would be uh, justified in not paying us. So um, you're, a, you're a critical link in making sure that our students get, uh, get the education that they need and, and, and the college continuing its operations. And the faculty have been um, very gracious and open-minded in working with the classified staff uh, in addressing this, uh, which frequently includes um, thinking outside the box and creative problem solving uh, in how we how we address uh, instructional uh, issues that involve classified. Uh, our chapter leadership has been keeping an eye on the news, a very a very close eye on the news, um, with specific interest toward things that affect classified staff. And as those issues come up, we bring them to the district. We've been working very closely with the district leadership in addressing these. 
uh, and we're very thankful for the um, open-minded and compassionate response that we've gotten from the district um, in addressing uh, issues um, that as they've come up uh, and a great example is the uh, the telecommuting agreement that we set up with the district um, to make sure that uh, all of our classified staff are able to continue to contribute to the operation of the college uh, with the challenges that we're all facing. Um, I'd like to also remind uh, all of our 262 chapter members uh, and, and all unit members that your executive board and uh, uh, negotiations team and stewards uh, are here to assist you um, with any, any issues that you have. Um, please, please bring them up uh, to us uh, and we will help you uh, address them. Um, because although we are isolated, we are not alone. Uh, we, we have resources, we, we still have each other just because we cannot be in the same room does not mean that we need uh, face challenges alone. Um, I hope that the, the silver lining to this all is that it, it uh, brings us closer together as colleagues, um, both within and outside of our bargaining units. Uh, and, and I've heard a lot that um, from, from folks inside and outside of our bargaining unit that um, well, this is this is very hard. It's 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 impossible. I, I don't know if I can do this. And to that, I'd like to close with a with a, a quote from um, former Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brande. Uh, Most of the things worth doing in this world had been declared impossible before they were done. So, um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Scrimmins. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I love the quote. Uh, next up is Johnny Hargitay, the president of CSEA 651. Johnny. Johnny didn't uh, connect to the webinar, so he's not here. Ah, all right. Then next up, we begin with our vice presidents. The first up is Richard Mann, the vice president of instruction. Richard. So I want to begin by echoing what others have said to express my appreciation to all of our classified employees who are so crucial to what we make available to our students, whether it's work in labs, computer labs, tutorial centers, in the Office of Instruction, getting the schedule of classes and catalog ready for students without that work, um, the students would not have the experience of Mount Sac that they have. So. Robert, I look forward to being on campus with you. I look forward to coming to that barbecue and um, you get a big hug from me on that day. As we look forward to what's ahead for the college in, in the area of instruction, uh, I think our, our fundamental challenge is to do, is to balance two things which come fundamentally to us as human beings, but one is a little bit more fundamental. The two things I think we are, are struggling to balance are hope and patience. And any of you who are, who are sheltering at home with small children know that the patience is a, is a slower lesson for us to learn. As President Scroggins indicated earlier, we had great hope that we'd, we would be able to prepare for fall by offering a very small controlled number of course sections on campus this summer. And the indication we've gotten from the LA County Department of Public Health just in the last couple of days has made us conclude that we will not be able to offer those courses. And so we have many, many hundreds of courses that will be offered this summer, but they will be online, not on campus. Those of you who are not familiar with the schedule planning process may not be aware that it takes literally months to put together the schedule of classes for a, um, a primary term, a fall or a spring semester. And typically in a fall, Mount SAC offers over 5,000 course sections. The most recent guidance that we have from the LA uh, Department of Public Health indicates that they anticipate that LA County will transition to stage three in late summer. Now, late summer sounds like good news to Mount SAC because it's the fall schedule that we're building. But unfortunately, if you look at your calendar, you will see that our fall semester 
begins in late August, but that your calendar tells you that summer stretches until late September. So I spent two hours with the deans this morning um, trying to put our best thoughts together about what our fall planning will look like. It has already been the case that we have asked faculty, chairs, and deans to build the fall schedule as much as possible with courses that could be offered online with no sacrifice in quality of instruction. So we had a small percentage of courses which we hoped would be online, but given the most recent news from the LA um, health authorities and knowing that we cannot wait until a day a week, we probably need a month before the beginning of instruction to be able to make any adjustments, we anticipate that in late July, we will need to decide whether we can offer any on-campus courses. And if we were inclined toward gambling, which most of us are not, we think the signs are not very propitious for being able to offer classes on campus in the fall. So today I began discussing with the deans the need to have a schedule available for um, no on-campus delivery, again with very narrow exceptions as President Scroggins described for public health, um, public safety programs, fire and EMS, for which we are actively seeking permission of LA health authorities to, to have a different um, set of protocols for those programs. All the deans impressed on me the need of faculty for, for time to plan. Um, and so over the next few days and week, we will be working toward developing a timetable by which we will be able to provide clear and ambiguous guidance to students, faculty, department chairs, deans. We are anticipating that will be in late July at the latest to provide students um, time to get into the right courses if they were enrolled in any of those that we hoped would be um, on campus. I want to close by saying that throughout this period that we have all had colleagues who have been particularly anxious about what the future holds. Those of us who are caregivers for older family members, uh, those of us who have small children with us who are um, more energetic vectors of the common cold and everything else that's contagious. And uh, I want to reassure all of you, as I know Morris will later, that we have only envisioned any opening of the campus on the assumption that we will have all the health protocols that health authorities guide us to provide. Um, we continue to work on those plans. And so I want to end by saying all that planning will serve a purpose. The hope we have does not tell us yet when we will be back on campus, but we know we will be back. And we are very confident that when we first come back that there will not be a vaccine, the virus will not be in our rear view mirror. So we plan for that day. We hope it will come soon. If not in fall, we'll be having this conversation about winter. If not for winter, we hope we are not having this conversation about spring 21, but we are planning in ways that will allow students to have the fullest possible educational experience at Mount SAC and to do so in a climate in which their, their health and safety is fundamental to that planning. Thank you, Richard. That was good insight into the, the certainties and uncertainties of our future in the campus. So uh, next up is our Vice President of Student Services, Audrey Yamagatanoji. Audrey. I thought my unmute was automatic, that it's being controlled this far. <laughs> Greetings to everybody. You know, we think about all that we're doing now and working in isolation and being separate from one another, but the words that come to my mind are still things like team, 
and collaboration and partnerships and family. We miss each other so much because the focus of our work is collaborating individually and in groups to support one another and especially our students. So on behalf of Student Services, I want to thank all of you that have worked so tirelessly to serve our students and to support what we're doing in student services, it does make a very, very big difference. We appreciate this week and not just this week, but our classified staff, our classified professionals. <clears throat> they are always with us every step of the way and play a very critical role in all that we do in student services. Our partnership with the faculty and managers across the campus has always been something that we're proud of and <clears throat> it, is, it is one of our strengths to be able to work together with all of you. And we also depend on our hourly workers and our student workers as well. And know that that's how we get things done. We work together and we build on each other's strengths. In particular, I do wanna recognize our, our partners that have really helped us get over some big humps in the road. IT, they have come to the rescue tirelessly with resources, with ideas, with staying up all night to figure out what is an EW, how does it work, and how can we make it happen and include a refund for students. <clears throat> That's where our partnerships with fiscal services come in as well, is because nobody can do this alone. Um, you'll see as I share a few other things that our partnerships with library, with custodial services, with police and Catholic safety, and even Sodexo have enabled us to do many, many things to support our students. Speaking of which, <clears throat> you may have heard, but 10,401 of our students received almost $7 million in Federal CARES Act grant money two weeks ago. This was due to the COVID-19 situation and our need to continue to support our students. <clears throat> they receive grants ranging between $400 to $900. We now have a special individual student grant where students themselves may apply. The first round was given to students receiving uh, federal Title IV grants that were eligible <clears throat> and applied for the FAFSA. Students can also apply separately and that form is available on the financial aid website and the student services website. We helped 700 students receive technology, uh, laptops and Wi-Fi wi -Fi units, um, and that was an incredible joint partnership effort. We have provided almost 3,000 meals to our neediest students on campus in partnership with the foundation. Thank you to those of you who did uh, collaborate and donate for that cause. <clears throat> we had a special project working with our faculty to reach students who just kind of vanished and are in need when we switched to remote and online learning. Uh, as of May 1st, we sent out 75,488 notices uh, for faculty to work uh, with their class sections on letting us know the students we needed to reach. <clears throat> and almost 2,400 students were marked as needing critical follow-up. And that follow-up was done both by email, but we know that all, not all students read their emails like they should. So we picked up the phone and called them, and that was calling 2,222 by my latest count of <clears throat> counseling center staff, as well as counselors, as well as library staff and from the tutoring center who have reached out to students individually who are just absolutely shocked. This is Mount Sac calling me? Me? Yes, because we care about you and that's the true message. Uh, along with that, this is our time of year when we have all kinds of ceremonies and celebrations and they are continuing, albeit in many interesting virtual formats. We do have the listing available on LiveWhale, so it's in the um, calendar. Uh, for the college, so you'll be able to see them all. <clears throat> we are starting even tomorrow night. We've already had the uh, uh, Women of Inspiration uh, ceremony. Tomorrow night is International Student Program, followed by the Arise Culture Night. 
Then we go to the following week with students and educators of distinction. And we really want to congratulate all of our recipients who are maybe tuned in today as our educators of distinction. And we also will have the Arise Milestones Recognition Ceremony on June 2nd, the REACH Ceremony June 3rd, the Puzzle Project June 5th, the Scholarship Ceremony June 6th. So if you missed Mount SAC because you were away, tune in because we will be live and virtual and bringing all of the recognitions and celebrations and ceremonies back to you. I look forward to answering any questions that you might have about anything related to students or student services. But again, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing, for the extra efforts. I know that being at home, working remotely, on some cases can be nice because we're with family and our home and safe. But at the same time, <clears throat> it's very taxing and exhausting. There's a lot of extra work, a lot of other demands to meet. And we realize that it has been a challenge. We realize that <clears throat> there are concerns about when we'll come back, how we'll come back. But the only thing I can tell you is we care about everybody's safety and security and we're going to work together to make it happen in the best way that we can, knowing that our students are just clamoring to come back. As some students have said to us, you know, I even just miss walking from class to class and being on campus. So thank you and best wishes to everybody. Thank you, Audrey. We really appreciate your dedication to students. Next up is our Vice President of Administrative Services, Morris Rodrigue. Morris. All right. Uh, first, I want to also talk about the classified employees. Uh, I am relatively new to Mount SAC, but both where I came from and where I have come to, uh, the, the passion and hardworking uh, classified groups are have just have they just do amazing work. Um, the COVID situation has amplified this, and uh, and they clearly are the backbone of admin services and, and the college. So I appreciate and applaud all the work that they do. Um, admin services uh, continues to work with all areas of the campus. Um, uh, it was already pointed out uh, to some extent by Audrey, the, the level of support related to IT. I'm amazed at the range of things that they do uh, from configuring laptops and MiFi devices rerouting phone numbers, and then still all the intricate programming that's involved for all the unique circumstances that COVID-19 has uh, provided them the opportunity to uh, engage their skills. Um, in risk management, uh, they've been working on FEMA funding and tracking that, the technical components behind obtaining, obtaining FEMA uh, funding is uh, challenging. Um, Fiscal uh, has been supporting uh, tracking for FEMA and also the Institutional Cares Act funds. They've been working on that. Um, that's in addition to all the other stuff that they normally do and other things that have come their way. Technical services continues to provide their expertise in instructional support, um, construction projects. They also are stepping up to the plate on multiple key task forces, task forces on campus, including a uh, taking the lead on implementing uh, electronic document approvals on campus. Um, facilities of the planning and management continue moving forward with construction and bond projects um, and uh, there are additional protocols for cleaning through uh, custodial and those type of things um, and, and uh, you know keeping our essential workers safe as they, for those ones that uh, cannot work remotely. Um, police and campus safety, they're the focal point of our emergency operations and are active, actively supporting our essential workers on campus, ensuring safety, preventing theft, and, uh, and supporting those campus, those employees that are working on campus. Um, one of the things that we're uh, tasked with right now are, is the institutional portion of the CARES Act funds. We've worked collaboratively with budget committee to focus on uh, principles for distributing the funds, and those are the type of funds that, uh, to a certain extent, will help support uh, uh, activities that won't, uh, that wouldn't be funded by the, well, or will be challenged to be funded as a result of cutbacks at the state level. So um, 
types of things that those funds could be used for, for example, are training employees to teach online. They could also still be used for additional student grants, but effectively they have to be associated with significant changes to the delivery of instruction due to coronavirus. But we're actively working on that. As was mentioned earlier, um, uh, I'm, I'm on the, uh, have the pleasure to chair the task force uh, to return to campus. Um, uh, earlier it was mentioned the five different stages. Uh, within the five different stages, there are uh, guidelines to develop protocols uh, related to returning to campus in phase three. And they're protecting and supporting worker and customer health and safety, ensuring appropriate physical distancing, ensuring equitable service, ensuring proper infection control and communicating with the public. So the task force has outlined tasks to look at, for instance, um, Richard talked about selected courses that may arrive. Well, we have to develop protocols around those. So we're established, we've established tasks that revolve around those protocols. Uh, for instance, um, when you look at uh, protecting, uh, protecting and supporting worker and customer safety, um, we're looking at course level COVID safety plans. So they work dir uh, directly with the instructors. We have a, a group of folks on the committee that are in process of that. Some of those were actually already developed uh, prior to the committee coming together related to particular like the EMT program and those type of things. So we have some outlines for different type of things. We're looking at supply chain, making sure we have a, a, our, the PPEs we need, cleaning supplies we need, temperature measuring devices, those type of things, developing protocols for uh, you know, hand washing and those type of things. Um, so we're looking at all, all kinds of different elements uh, related to returning uh, in a limited capacity back to campus. The uh, last big topic that I want to talk about is the May revision. Keep in mind that when we take a look at budgets uh, or the budget timeline in January, the government made a proposal that was based on some much different uh, budget scenarios. Then uh, Department of Finance, uh, prior to the May revision, came out with the estimate of a 54 billion budget shortfall. And that's a combination of 1920, 2021, part of about 41 million of that is revenue. The other part is uh, additional services. There's additional services that the state have been providing that cost money. So that's sort of the development of that, uh, of that estimate. What it means for us is, uh, so in this timeline, the May revise happens and they have to pass the budget in June. So that's sort of the, 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 time, the part of the timeline we're in. So some of the things that they did in the May revision, um, a key component was for 1920, I was a little concerned because part of the, the revenue shortfall is related to 1920, but they did some technical adjustments within the budget. And then there's a, a K-14 rainy day fund that uh, didn't have a lot of money in it, but they used those funds to sort of uh, help prevent a, a reduction in 1920. That was also combined with uh, deferring about 330 million um, from 1920 to, uh, to, or from 1920 to 2021. Um, so let's kind of go around some of the different other key things related to the May revision. So I just talked about deferrals. So deferrals on the surface seem really bad. And this, and the reason they're bad is because effectively they're, they're saying, okay, you, you have these funds for your budget this year, but we're not going to give you those, all of those funds until next year. And so for instance, in 1920, they're saying, okay, there's $330 million that they're, uh, that effectively colleges can allocate or can budget for in 1920, but we're, the state's gonna budget it for 2021. And so it's kind of an accounting magic thing that they do. Effectively what that means for us is we take less of a cut, which is the good part of a deferral, but it means we have to have additional cash available to basically cover those costs until we get the funds the next year. And then they're gonna, they're looking, proposing a larger deferral of about uh, 660 million-ish uh, in 
from 2021, deferring it into 2122. Um, for 1920, uh, a $330 million deferral uh, to Mount SAC is about $12.4 million. And you, you can uh, double that when you take a look at uh, the following year. So, so that's part of what Dr. Scroggins talked about earlier was the fact that we have these good fund balances and it's, it's having that cash available that allows us to sustain when we have these deferrals and these cuts. Um, the other, the, the other, the other, the big ticket item was the reduction to the SCFF funding component of the formula. Um, the, uh, Dr. Scroggins already talked about it in the sense that they, they called it a 10% cut, but it's not really a 10% because they're, they're effectively taking COLA off the top of that 10%. So you have this 7.7% reduction in, um, in SCFF rates. And so basically your per FTS rates and your metric rates would reduce by about 7.7%. Um, fortunately for us, in 1920, uh, the what we call P1 in our first reporting level, our SCFF rate was 197 million. That 197 million, there was not an expectation that we would have 197 million in 1920 because we had to wait to P1 to find out because they had delayed everything in terms of uh, rebenching the formulas. So it was good news that that, that came up uh, to that number, and it was also good news that we hadn't overcommitted at that point in time uh, related to our 1920 budget. So that means they're they're taking that 197 million effectively that we didn't realize we were uh, going to have at P1 until P1 came out, adding the 10% to that and then cutting back off of that. So effectively it won't feel like as much, of, it won't feel like a 7.7% cut to us in the sense that we weren't assuming a certain level in the first place. Um, one of the other big challenges here is the strong workforce funding. Uh, they did a 57% reduction. There was an irony in the budget to me and, and other, uh, other elements of this budget to other people, but they're asking us to you know, train our workforce and prepare them coming out of the COVID-19, but there's a 57% reduction, which is about a 1.2 million reduction in our strong workforce funding. Student equity and achievement, while most, cat like many of our categoricals did not receive a cut, they just didn't receive COLA, uh, student equity and achievement, uh, they're recommending a 15% reduction. Keep in mind, when I say received a cut, what I'm really saying is, the May revise is recommending that. Nothing's in stone until uh, June passes. Um, and that's about 1.8 million. Uh, as Dr. Scroggins talked about earlier, there's a commitment by the state that if, uh, if um, the federal government provides additional funding that uh, can, can be used to support uh, community colleges, then they will uh, reduce some of the levels of these uh, recommended reductions that may revise. Another, uh, you know, good component that came out of this is it's clear that the state is committed to continuing um, Prop 51 projects. What is, is our, those are, that's this latest state uh, bond projects. And we have uh, a couple of projects here, our, our gymnasium and wellness uh, project that's, uh, in part funded by Prop 51 funds and the state's committing to continue that. We also have a tech and health uh, project that's approved and would be queuing up uh, to start design uh, drawings next year. So the fact that there is a commitment to continue that is promising. They clearly are recognizing that uh, construction and building will help the economy. And, and so it's important that they continue that. Um, locally, we're working on developing a tentative budget. Uh, we'll be discussing some things in budget committee today. Um, and so basically that tentative that we develop will be reflect the May revision because it's our best knowledge at this time, the direction the state is looking at related to budget. Once again, I want to emphasize that whenever we're um, in a situation like this, uh, you know, it's not a, a great place to be but 
everybody here is at a great place to be because Mount SAC has been conservative with their funds. And what that means is we can be, we can, we don't have to react to a situation financially, but rather we can plan and we're proactive and thinking about how we work our way through uh, the particular challenges. So it may get frosty in hiring, those type of things, you know, we'll look at these different funds that we have. For instance, uh, Dr. Scroggins talked about the STRS and PERS trust. So there's different areas that, that we can help uh, mitigate the impact um, as we work our way through next year. But I'm, I'm confident that, uh, that, that moving forward, we're well positioned to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Morris. I like my chief financial officer to say he's confident. Thank, thank you. That's reassuring. <laughs> yeah. uh, next up is Abe Ali, the vice president of human resources. Abe. Right. Happy classified uh, folks weeks week and uh, happy belated uh, Teachers Day. Uh, and to my managers, Hope y'all are doing well. Um, boy, it's been a, a, a big change, but uh, Human Resources has been working together with, uh, with faculty, classified, and the meet and confer labor units uh, to make transitions into these uncharted COVID-19 pandemic times. Um, I must profess that it's been disappointing to see such an abrupt uh, change from what was normal working, uh, a normal working environment to a, a challenging abnormal work environment. So I have sympathies and I have challenges and fears just like everyone else does. And um, for that, I'm going to do my best to, to make change and to be sensitive to that in, in my work. Uh, to uh, our Mount, Mount Sac family. Our personal lives have been affected, unfortunately, and it's been difficult for all of us to balance. Uh, to that end, I, I, I would like to assure everyone that we're gonna improve um, our commitment to be more compassionate and caring for our Mount Sac family folks. That is a general guide that we've always had, but that's a particular emphasis in all the work that we're doing and that I happen to be managing in your human resources uh, division. Uh, I want you to reach out to family. I know you have personal challenges. Uh, we have uh, employee assistance programs and counseling. You have good health care um, to, to assist you and we're happy to get you connected with those services and uh, as you know, we, we, we don't dip into your privacy on those issues. Those will maintain confidentiality, but we just want to make sure you're supported and you access the services that are available to you uh, as an employee. Uh, human Resources appreciates and values our labor uh, and meet and confer leadership uh, during this pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of work we've been engaged in and we will do our best to continue good faith lab labor uh, transitions into this different environment. Human Resources supporting several training initiatives and professional development. Also, we are providing support for temporary labor agreements to ensure that we hear all sides of progress and support uh, our faculty and staff working conditions in this pandemic environment. We will continue to improve our listening ears and have an open mind with the interest of moving forward together as one. As presented uh, by the Los Angeles County Roadmap Guidelines, stage three is a key uh, stage in our return to on-site work. I'm confident that each labor unit uh, will be prepared to support safe working conditions. Uh, and we'll, we'll We'll get this done and be, be ready uh, to uh, return folks to campus uh, in a safe environment. Um, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize that we have some resources online. 
um, keeping you up to date as far as some of the agreements that we are uh, reaching, um, as well as services that are available to you. And we do have a, a call line that you can ask any of your questions regarding your leaves and, 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 and those types of um, uh, working condition issues and interpretations for that. We'll get service to you and get the work done that, that, that you require and the support that you require. Um, mahalo for hearing me out and uh, look forward to um, moving together in, in, in conquering um, uh, this COVID-19 effect environment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Abe. So our, our uh, scheduled ending time gives us a few minutes uh, of uh, flex for questions and answers. And uh, we've got our noble director of community uh, relations, Jill Dolan. Uh, Good afternoon. Will you lead us through a question and answer period? Sure, some of the questions that I've seen. The first one is when will the nursing program open up admissions for um, applicants. They want to know what their plan B is in case they don't get accepted to Mount Sachs program. Richard, you want to take that one? Richard, uh, are you You're able on to- mute, Richard. Like Audrey, I thought it was automatic. Actually, I know better, I just forgot. Um, so both President Scroggins and I talked about um, the college's interest in working with the LA Department of Public Health to get a little bit more flexibility for our health science programs. But almost certainly the initial flexibility would not be for students coming into the program, but for students who are very close to completion, graduation, and being able to progress into the, uh, into the workforce with, with that profession that they have chosen. As we think about how to balance hope and patience, I'm afraid that students hoping to get into the nursing program are going to need a little bit more patience than students who are already in those health science programs. Um, there's really kind of a slippery slope where if we ask that question, then students will say, well, I want to apply to the nursing program, but first I have to get microbiology. And then there would be students who say, I want to apply to the nursing program, but I need my general education courses first. So certainly as a college, we want to open up as much of the curriculum as soon as possible. But in the, in the respect of those health programs, it will be the students who are in the pipeline, progressing toward those goals who we will have as our first priority. And then as we have gradual clearance from health authorities to make more and more of the, of the programs open for admissions processes, we will get to you, Mandy, as quickly as we can. And unfortunately, probably the, the problems that we're facing will be the case for most nursing programs in urban Southern California. LA County is pretty big and nursing programs throughout LA County will be looking at the same restrictions. I can't imagine Orange County or Riverside County, which had some of the earliest, highest rates of infection and mortality will be any better so. I hope that Mount SAC will continue to be your first hope. If you can get in somewhere else, those programs are very competitive, but I hope we'll be there for you and that we will be your first shot to um, progress to that next stage in your life. Thanks, Richard. Um, there's also a question, this uh, is probably for Abe. Is there a status update regarding reclassification or classification requests? If there is a budget concern, is there a plan of action to resolve issues of classified employees currently working out of class or being compensated for the work they have been doing? Okay, good question. Uh, we just, uh, um, the, the reclassification committee has been meeting. Uh, we, we just started up again. And um, in matter of fact, right now there were, uh, there's six different classifications that are on the table, uh, ready to be decided upon. So uh, quick answer is no, there's not been uh, um, a change in, in process or a moratorium or of any kind directed uh, to our department, to the committee. 
Uh, that work continues. Um, we will uh, continue to make those presentations for reclassification and the work that, that's done. We're also making classification changes to, as mentioned uh, prior, uh, custodial services. So in addition to this reclassification process. So um, we find that, that approach to be uh, a, a healthy one, even in uh, hard economic times to make sure that uh, folks' work is being recognized and, um, um, and, and we'll, we'll, we, we will continue to do that. Okay. You're just, to add brief, hard... just to add briefly to that, there, there is a, a, a necessity to identify funds to cover the cost of the reclassification, and that is a consideration in management approval of a recommendation for reclassification. Stay on the hot seat, Abe. This is also for you. What about new hires that were approved by Senate for this year and were put on hold? That's the faculty uh, side, I think. Oh, uh, sorry. Richard, Richard has been having a conversation. I can speak to classified and management positions. But I'll let Richard uh, take that one. <laughs> so Bill and I spoke about that literally yesterday. Most of you know that we are not using the, the expression hiring freeze, but hiring frost. And in the conversation, Bill committed to bring to cabinet tomorrow some criteria that could be used broadly across the campus to determine which positions continue to be most critical for Mount SAC to meet the needs of our students. And um, I was in email communication with Chisa about that yesterday evening. So I am expecting that within a few days, we will have clear guidance about which of those can move forward. Chisa, did you want to answer also? I saw that you. Oh, I, I think it's just a matter of us continuing conversations and, um, and my push is just to make sure that the Senate remains involved in the decision making and that we are ensuring we're doing our best to serve students um, that we can in the current situation. So faculty will hear more about that and Richard and I will talk more about that. Okay. And the criteria for uh, uh, hiring during the frost will, will be shared with all uh, unit representatives and, and before it's implemented. We may have some, some, some critical positions that we decide now given that, that the, the May revise is bad, but as Morris pointed out, it's survivable. We may have some critical positions that we want to recommend to move forward right away, but the, the criteria for the larger group of vacant positions will, will be shared uh, widely among the constituent group leaders so that we, we, we understand what our practices will be going forward during the hiring frost. Um, another question is, will telecommuting continue into the end of summer or till the end of fall? I'll take that one. So that the, uh, the, the, the stay at home has two um, um, control venues. One is the governor and the other one is the LA County uh, Department of Public Health. So the, the stay at home began with a governor's executive order until the, the governor's process, which he's laid out in his six steps, makes it possible for the college to be part of the reopening of California. And you've seen that's phase three in the state and stage three in the county roadmap. The, those emergency uh, conditions will stay in place and the critical on-site workers process, the telecommuting will stay in place. So if we're in stage three, phase three, and we're able to uh, open up the campus even under the, the, the social distancing and high hygiene circumstances, that will signal that we can bring workers back to campus under those conditions. I'll say that the word there is can, we'll work with all representative groups to uh, develop a process for return to campus. It won't just be on one day and off the next. 
And this next, we've, oh. we've, we've already been um, discussing that with the district and, and thank you to the district for reaching out to us about staying ahead of that and um, making sure that we have already thought about what that looks like uh, and processes for accomplishing that. Um, so that for the classified staff, we, we've already started talking about that to make sure that we're, um, we have good solid planning in place for when that eventuality happens. Right. Thank you. Chisa is going ahead and answer this one. Are there talks of eliminating spot cert certifications now that faculty have demonstrated their ability to teach online? So we won't be eliminating spot certification. The, um, the complexity of what goes into the spot certification and gaining a spot certification remains really essential to being um, able to teach in our regular distance learning courses. We do have alternative training that has been developed and we're getting ready to launch hopefully this week um, that uh, we, we are calling FOMAR, so Fully Online by Mutual Agreement Readiness. And that um, is gonna be a four hour training series that faculty can take to teach online for summer or for fall that, that that will mean that they do not need to be spot certified so if you're already spot certified you don't have to worry about the foma readiness training if you are not yet spot certified there will be the four hour training available for all faculty to take and um, I just before coming on to the town hall was working on drafting my email to all the faculty that explains the complexities of this, getting the agreement um, of what would be included in the training was something that happened through academic senate and then compensation for faculty for the training components for the new pieces of training folks would be doing happened with collaboration with the district and faculty association um, and so we've got i think a terrific plan together we continue to have responsibility to ensure accessibility to resources for our students to make sure that we're providing equitable um, instruction in the online environment. So we, we need to have um, that training for faculty to ensure that that's happening. So we're going to be going forward with that um, and look for details to follow very shortly in your email for faculty. Thanks, Chisa. Um, this next question has kind of been answered, but um, maybe we can just answer it again. Do we know when classified 651 will begin to return to work? So again, when the state uh, says we're at uh, phase three to have high risk uh, activities and professions coming back, by the way, stage four is to have large scale events. So don't plan on large scale events for any time soon. Okay. That's one, but the, the county can, can have restrictions that are the more uh, limiting than the state, and they are, LA's got a, a harder route to solve the, the COVID-19 issue than many other parts of the state. So this, the county also has to be at phase three, which is the reopening of community colleges. Those are the triggers that says that for the, the stay at home emergency is over, it's time to return to work on campus. And again, we'll negotiate the circumstances of that with each of our representative groups. Okay, it's 226, so this might be the last question and Joan would like to answer it. It's again about the spot certification. If we complete the four hour training, does that supplant the spot certification? Or if we take the spot now, will we still need the four hour training? And there's a couple of answers to this, and this is that you're going to have a choice. So when Jesus said she's sending out an email, it'll be coming very closely attached to an email from myself in the district. You're going to have a choice on whether or not to teach in the summer, to teach the, the, the FOMA training and get paid for it now. If you're just starting spot training, you will not be certified in order to teach in the summer. There's no way you're going to be able to make that, even if you could finish the classes, there's no way we can get you the spot certification in time because it has to 
go through a review process. So if you're trying to teach in the summer and you do not have spot certification, please do the FOMA training. Now you have choices with the FOMA training, whether you wanna do the complete four hours of it or two hours of it, or if you're gonna to wanna to move it and, and start with the FOMA training and then go to spot training. But, but for the summer, your best bet is going to be FOMA training, FOMAR training, um, in order to be able to teach this summer because you will not be spot certified in time to teach the summer if you are just starting that right now that is not going to happen it's not enough time not enough people looking reviewing i mean we've added more people to review but that still won't give us enough time to review the spot so do the forma foma f-o-m-a-r training for summer to make sure you're okay to teach in the summer okay i'll make this the last one and then i just want to add that any questions that were not answered during this time period and that are still coming in we will answer those and post those on the town hall website which is www.mountsac.edu town hall and we'll also be posting the transcripts and the powerpoint so stay tuned for that that'll be done by the end of the week so Regarding classes in the fall, if we begin with fall classes mostly online, can we switch mid-semester to in-person classes? The answer to that, I think, is almost certainly no. Okay. Um, because the logistics of getting students into a classroom at a specified time would be incredibly challenging. If faculty are scheduled a second eight-week class that has not begun and is set up with a um, a specified time slot, that might be possible. But to begin an online class and bring it back on campus midway through the course of the, of the, of the class would be challenging to the detriment of students. Okay. But there is a way that they could maybe challenge, change the way they schedule some of this stuff and maybe labs could be done in the second half online if they couldn't get them on. I mean, there are other, there's some challenging, some interesting creative ways you could maybe do some scheduling, right? And that conversation should be happening with chairs and deans. Okay, so at this point, I think it's Bill's opportunity to wrap things up. Unmute. Bill, I can't hear you. All right, I'm here. There we go. <laughs> I want to thank the entire panel for their insight, for their uh, directness, and for their support of the collaborative work that we do at the college. Thank, thank you all for being part of this event. I'll, I'll say that we're, we're going to have an, another one of these uh, right after the beginning of the fall semester. As you heard from many of us, the circumstances will change towards the end of the summer and as we begin fall we'll have more of a uh, an idea of where some of these unfinished questions will at, at least be more well defined then and finally i'd like to make some personal observations um, i miss you I, I miss being on campus i i miss uh Everything from pizza with the president to settling a grievance across the table from Joan. This interaction is, is the fuel that stokes my passion for this work. And, 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 and I have to say that in, in challenges like you're hearing here, that, that's, that's what all of us need to do. We need to reach down to, to, to our passion, our dedication, to, to reassess our, our value system and, and rebench ourselves to say, okay, I, I, I've got what it takes. I'm gonna reach down in that well and make it happen. But what fills that well for me is you, to, to, to hear what you say and, and to, to have it a dialogue, a, a give and take. My entire life, as I'm sure yours is, is scripted. I have to sit in, a, in advance, a Zoom meeting, and it has to be a defined agenda, and it has to be prepared. And, and that, that's not uh, the best way to come up with solutions in a people-oriented business. It, 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 I, so I miss that. 
uh, it, it gives me pause to think about things when I have those quiet moments, as, as I'm sure many of you have. And it's those, the, when I'm busy, yeah, 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 as I'm sure that's true for you. But those quiet mo moments when I reflect on where I am, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. I don't like to go to sleep thinking about what change is going to happen tomorrow that I don't know about. That, that uncertainty, that lack of preparation, it, it's just against the human condition. In, in addition, to, to not be out in my community, to not have a sense of the, the, the collective human condition it is challenging. I, I want to be there so that I, I can feel what you're feeling. That is an important part of the way I need to have the, the foundation to be able to, to make the decisions and lead the conversations going forward. Fortunately, I have a, a loving wife and daughter, and they are my sanctuary in this time. And I'm hoping that all of you are reaching out to those that you can, that are close to you. Uh, and for those of you who have the opportunity to have whatever technology mediated connection to make the most of that as well. That's one of the reasons we wanted to have this town hall and, and the, in this webinar format is to be for you to be able to hear from the, the, this wonderful group of people that every single observation that they had was about what's best for you for our faculty, staff, and managers, what's best for our students, what's best for our community. And you can tell that melding together this level of dedication, knowledge, and collaboration is what makes Mount Sac great. Sleepless nights may still come, and they do for me, but remember that uh, this too will pass. We'll hear for you. Uh, it, if it's difficult to reach out, it doesn't mean it's not there for you. You've got wonderful leaders who already expressed the desire to hear from you and to respond to your needs. Collectively, we commit to that. So we, we are here as a collective body of, of, of committed individuals who feel what you feel, who share your your challenges, your worries, your trepidation, but in the morning, get up to take on those new challenges as you have all been remarkable to do. Thank you for participating today, and thank you for all who made this possible.